two, one. What's going on guys? Sitting here with Matt. Matt just got back from competing at Mundial S uh, Masters Old Person World Championship in Vegas. I uh, got to have some matches, had some of the devotion people out there. Uh, got to, we'll, we'll dive into experiencing Brazilian culture firsthand in America at a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu tournament. Uh, I was not there because uh, I had a kid and, and custody is now being forced upon me and I'm not looking to spare at all. But, uh, so I was here for that. So why don't you give us the, the breakdown? Nobody won gold, so nothing really matters. Well, uh, Josh won At, at Jiu Jitsu Con, yeah, as a white belt, our oldest brother Josh took gold. Had an, a couple of good matches. One that he was, uh, 30 seconds left, he was down by five points. Yeah. And on his back, and he swept and passed. And, uh, it, and, and so the points he goal. needed to do. The, the best part about match. Josh's performance this year was he didn't try to cross collar choke anyone from the yes, inside yes. their guard. Um, uh, that was yeah. good. Um, you know, everybody did really well. Um, There's a lot of things, you know, to kind of learn. Uh, I enjoyed being there. Uh, I wasn't going to compete initially uh, for a while. Just I had so many injuries and everything. And then, you know, you just realize that this is what you do. And be injured. Be injured, yeah. <laughs> and then, and you then you'll, you'll never know. You, I've seen, I've won injured before. You, I've seen people win injured before. You never really know when it's going to be your year. I've been at, at Panzer Worlds watching Marilla Santana from Unity compete. Covered Quite literally show. mummified in tape yeah. because Brazilians think that yeah. whatever it is, you just tape it. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and so one, I was glad to be there, whether I was competing or not, just to be a person who's. This is my fourth year, uh, I believe, at Worlds, um, and uh, fifth, fifth, fourth year, yeah. And so just having that experience and being able to take people who haven't been there before yeah. and kind of be able to calm them down and guide them through the process. Uh, was was very important to me from cu being able to keep people calm when they got where they're a little heavy knowing Fair how to cut weight Coaching uh, jiu-jitsu isn't standing on the sideline going yeah. no yes. Yes. yes no, no get out of there. No So many so many, so many coaches uh, I've seen do that. But so that, so that was very nice You know I tied, got Josh dropped down to on weight got angel dropped down to on weight when they were a little heavy Yeah, uh, so that was good we had, I personally believe we got robbed a little bit by the ref, but you know, unless I'm not just in jujitsu, but in life. You can go you know, watch the match on Flow yeah. Grappling. And, you, don't, uh, you don't leave it in the ref's hands, and you know, if you're waiting for somebody else to give you something, then uh, it relies on somebody else. So there's a, there's a lesson in that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if jujitsu is an expression of yeah. the way that you live your life, I can definitely say that I have similar lessons to learn. I, uh, you want to be on jujitsu welfare. Right, you you right. just hang out and then you wait for the ref to tell you you won. Right. Uh, Ellie, one of our gals, she won three to three matches Very well. out of a bracket where it was six to gold, I think. Yeah. So tough bracket, uh, but did really well. She's only she's a, she's a fresh blue belt. She's yeah. only had her blue belt for a few months, yeah. and so working your way through half the bracket as a fresh blue, pretty sick, pretty, 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 pretty good. Sweet. And finish your last match on top, you know. Uh, yeah. Time and points and the way that the system goes is you really got to know how to play your game and you really got to know. A, a tiny little mistakes can be the difference, you know, yeah. between winning. And sometimes it's not jujitsu mistakes; it's mental mistakes that you make. Uh, you know, during what, the what did you see? Uh, I forgot to ask you. I was going to ask about this. You guys went down there and had watched the matches and stuff like that. You know, one of the things we've been talking about a lot is watching um, since like leg locks had sort of dominated the world for so long. But now you're seeing guys like uh, the Rotolo brothers and and. Mika Galbao and guys who kind of play this, it's not that they're not capable of leg locking, but they play this very old school game where a lot of it is based on shutting those down from a top game. Did you see anything cool or any, any interesting competitors? Or um, Well, one, uh, one of the greatest things that I saw that was a good lesson for some of our people to learn is Megaton. Mm -hmm. um, if you've ever been to world championships or anything, you realize that Megaton, I believe, is 60 years old now, and he has competed, I believe, at every single world since he's gotten his black belt. Um, yeah. and, and he's only all, all while managing to be a, a, a ranking guy in a, a yeah. really serious one percenter yeah, club yeah. and all the rest. He's a and, and this guy, dude. this guy has only won six times, mm -hmm. you know. So you go out there, you lay on the line all the time, you're not always going to win. He yeah. got his coral belt, uh, actually. Oh, really? Yeah, that's awesome. Um, 
But as far as the leg lock game goes and what game happens, and I try and tell this to a lot of people when they compete, you're, the game that you're training here on the mats is not the game necessarily that's gonna win you the matches, right? You're almost, and I found this out uh, as a blue belt and, a, and, and again as a purple belt, is that old school jiu-jitsu still works. Mm. Um, having good sweeps, good top pressure, yeah. and simple submissions. Mm. Um, yes, you can go out there and dazzle sometimes, and sometimes your new A game yeah. will come out and you'll be able to get to apply it. But generally what you if see if your is, A game is a barrel load, an inverted squid, right, whatever. There's, and the, the other thing is, is that when these new games that come out, people are confused when they see them, right? But now most gyms have a lot of no-gi uh, classes mm -hmm. and a lot of no-gi competitors. So, players. so when you were just doing leg locks, you were confusing people because they hadn't seen it before. Mm -hmm. But now these people, even at Blue Belt, maybe in a gym where everybody's doing leg locks or everybody's doing X guards or something like that. So they know how to deal with it. Yeah. So you get out there and you may be the one guy at your gym who does it, but you don't realize that maybe these guys are doing it a lot or sure. their black belt is playing this game. So they have a better comprehension of it. Uh, but yeah, essentially, at least through purple belt, you know, is, you know, takedowns or just dominant sweeps and, uh, and heavy top pressure. One of the things that you and I were talking about at lunch too is, you know, if you're, if you are somebody doing jujitsu, one of, one of the things that especially I think from, from like white to purple that separates people's skill levels, the strongest is just guard passing. Yeah. <laughs> God, long COVID. And there uh, were people out there, I was watching the purple belts who were out there who maybe get the takedown and couldn't, couldn't pass. pass the guard. Yeah, and, I, and it's I, not that the guards were that great, yeah. it's that the guard passing is that bad. I realized that when we were at the old space and we had a dude coming in who at the time was a brown belt, but he'd been a brown belt like four and a half years, he's a black belt now. And uh, I had just got my purple belt, but I maybe like, he was there when I was a blue belt still too, and then through getting a purple belt, I could not pass this guy's guard. I mean, I just couldn't, I couldn't do anything for his guard. Every time I thought I was getting passed, I was actually getting all applauded or like loop choked. And uh, I realized that when I got my purple belt, I think I spent the first year of purple, all I did was guard pass and guard retention. That was it. I really didn't. And now I feel like my submissions are retarded. Um, yeah, well, have only have been retarded. It's kind of like only one part of your game uh, can, yeah. can build at a time. And for me, you know, I was talking with one of the guys who, the guy who beat me at last pans. Mm -hmm. Uh, he was there. He wasn't competing because he was injured, but he was there watching. He, he came and watched all my matches. Cool. He, you know, was out there rooting for the guys that he's going to be against. Sure. Uh, really classy guy. But, you know, as we were discussing my loss, you know, I said, I said, I love when I, I'd rather get buzz sawed through, yeah. get the shit kicked out of me and get choked out and lose that way. Because you can take that and say, I need to get better at jujitsu. Jujitsu is easy to learn. You come in, you get the reps, you get better at jujitsu. Mm -hmm. um, when you realize that it's mental decisions and, and, and how you're applying certain things is the difference between you and winning. And it's like, I've been fucking myself my whole life. How am I, now I have to learn how to not fuck myself. Like that, that's, you can't, it's a lot harder to get reps at that yeah. than it is to come into the gym. <clears throat> well, and no doubt. And, and a lot of, you know, what we were talking about too, where you were talking about losing by decision and not leaving it up to the ref. Uh, Mitch, our, our coach, Mitch McElroy, was in here for one of our circle of honors a few weeks back. And he said, uh, you know, we're, we're looking here at first points. That's what we were doing for our game. And he said, you know, just think about this. You go out to pans, you go out to compete, whatever. And uh, you both go in hard as shit. You and the other guy, you fight hard. Uh, maybe you lose the takedown. You get a sweep. You get onto the top. You shoot for a hard submission. He reverses it and you get submitted. That's one way to lose. Or you get the shit kicked out of you the whole match, you look over, it's like 14 to nothing and you haven't even put points on the board. Which way would you rather lose, right? Everybody would rather lose putting it on the line and getting out there and, and, and trying to work. And, you know, you'll see a lot of people, I think, who come in to compete and they're looking to compete and say, well, I'll get some points on the board and then I'll stall it out or whatever. And it's, it's the most cliche kind of shit, but it's like you don't get to Valhalla by, right. by like putting a couple points on the board and then stalling it out. And, and, and the hardest thing to try and change your mind about that is you watch people consistently win that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you think, and you, this <laughs> moment in your mind, you think that that's the way to go. Yeah. And then you realize that this, How will, do you this will be win? the second time at a, at a world, at yeah. a purple belt, that 
I, I was thinking about, uh, and this is what the one guy that I was talking to said. He said, I watched you and this Robert F. guy who was also another favorite to win. And he said, there were guys that came out here trying to win and there were guys that came out here that were thinking about the, the gold medal match and were just trying not to lose their matches up until then. You know, and it's a market difference yeah, in performance. It's, it's you know, we, we've got the quotes on the walls and everything like that, but it's that Musashi quote. He says that the only reason that a warrior is alive is to fight, and the only reason to fight is to win. And you can't look at any of these matches as being laddered up to one more important. Each one of them is, you gotta fight to win. Um, you know, and I, and I like that about competition. I don't compete very well. You know, I have not won a lot of matches in competition, but I don't, I don't usually have much left in the tank. And that's one of the reasons that I lose is like, yeah. you know, you'll go for broke and then realize in your third match that your, your muscle endurance isn't there or your cardio is not there or whatever. And it's one of the reasons why all these aspects of the game are so important. But, uh, one of the other things, you know, cause we haven't done one of these in since pants. Yeah. And, uh, you know, but we had done, we did our own in-house uh, tournament Blood here, on Blood on the Mats, and you can check out a little awesome. video recap of that on the Devotion YouTube. But, um, you know, one of the things that we were talking about, about uh, or at that was the idea of, you know, you're fostering a culture either of sport jujitsu or you're fostering a culture of, of violence, of fighting, of street fighting. And I think that... Everyone's heard the Chris Haller thing, you know, the like think street and, and train the sport and all that kind of shit. But you really do start thinking about this when you're when you're working. And then, you know, we were getting pretty rowdy this week and some guys were throwing some punches into their grappling matches and stuff, having fun up by the fire. And, you know, cultivating that violence is helpful in competition too because it creates that necessity of action. Fast game. You're yeah. not gonna sit there and you're not gonna to sit there and play guard. You're gonna right. like, you're gonna like express your guard and yeah. get out as and sweep as fast. And it's as it's one of the things that even with guys like you, who you know you you train mostly in the gi, but you still yeah. enjoy no gi. Right. You know, and when you train no gi, we have totally different feeling uh, roles because right. they're all way faster. Um, and also, it definitely feels in no gi like somebody might hit you at any time, you know what I mean? And, uh, you know, I, I was just talking about this with some of the guys over the weekend, too, just about a culture of violence. Like, what does that mean? And Because one of our, our young guys, uh, who's not in the Wolves, but is in the Wolves because he's grown up with us and everything. We've known him since he was two years old. And he and one of the older guys were, you know, you know how it starts. They start out slap fighting and then it turns into, you know, some a little bit of bare knuckle. And he's young and he, I saw him get popped and I said, oh God, I'm gonna have to explain this to his mom. And then, you know, he swings back and pops our guy and it was great and, you know, they had a good time. And this idea of there's a way to foster, uh, you know, they, they all, this is always a bad to like a culture of violence. Right. But there's a way to foster a culture of violence or a familiarity with violence. So like young you start people. by beating your kids. So <laughs> you beat the shit out of your kids <laughs> from the time they're born. But yeah, but introducing them to violence in a controlled way. Right. Um, but, you know, I, I think that the way kids are introduced to this stuff nowadays is so chinless that, you know, we call it new jitsu, you know, where jujitsu does not prepare a kid for street violence. Right. It prepares him to wear a Ninja Turtles rash guard and right. go out and, and like, it, it's become really bad, dude. I mean, you look at the old heads and it's like Gordon Ryan said, well, this is all about honor, and, and he, he fucked this up because of the way he said it. He goes, is it? No, it was about Brazilian guys beating the shit out of each other at each other's gyms. And you're like, yes, that is about honor. And he said, well, it's not about respect. It's about disrespecting other dudes' right. styles and beating the shit out of them. But that nowadays, you know, you go to a jiu-jitsu thing, and it really is. It's just the sport, and it's so deballed right. that, you well, know. And it, yeah, I think the... One of the issues with it is that it's getting pulled in so many different directions. It's like yeah. a baby that has like somebody pulling at every limb yeah. trying to, to get it. Because you have the some of the the brands that would lend themselves to be more violent are like veteran tactical companies that are like <laughs> acting like that, you know, that they're coming here, you know, and you hear people say this, I'm prepared to die out there. He'll have to kill me. That's like, no, that's a fucking bullshit lie. One, you're not, if you die in a jujitsu tournament, <laughs> then yeah, but you were never going to win. Anyway. I mean, honestly, depending <laughs> on how it can be sick, um, like you're probably not going to die. Right. And, uh, but so you, you have this thing and you, it becomes this like boomer wannabe honor culture 
but that it's so cucked out because they won't go all the way or their ideas of, of what this means are off. But they're dragging it in this direction of like, yes, it's self-defense, yeah, yeah. Kramaga kind of stuff. But then you see their practitioners out there and you know, yeah, they got a high and tight and a big beard and maybe they have their gi has like a- Texas Death uh, Squad. Yeah, you know, some stuff like that. Doom Patrol. But when you see the character of people, the, the idea of people is it's it's usually a lot of, you know, like lower belt levels that are veterans that are maybe like getting into it now and starting to find positive ways yeah, to express that. Yeah, nothing against veterans getting into jiu -jitsu. Right, but, but it's the stuff, and this is what I've always said, is you take this stuff from the mats and you teach and you, you apply that off the mats, yeah. not take everything that you have from the mats and pull it, drag it with you to that. But then you see they're pulling in one direction, and then you have, you know, this younger generation of kids that are like anti-violent, you know, that, that don't understand any of this stuff, that want to come out there and cook pizza or whatever, like Mikey or something. Yeah, and, and, and they want jujitsu for everyone again, you yeah. know, and all this stuff. And then with the Power Ranger geese on and stuff, yeah. you're like, that ain't it either, man. Yeah, you know, and I think it's one of those things where guys like us are always going to wind up being kind of dinosaurs with it because we missed the time frame when you could go and fuck dudes up at their dojo or whatever and all that. And remembering, you know, and this is what we talked about while you guys were competing at Worlds, you know, that jujitsu largely came about and, and the, the different styles and all this kind of stuff came about as a product that you couldn't go challenge somebody with a sword and kill them anymore. Right. So how do you still live a lifestyle of warriorship and training and all that kind of stuff? And this is how you do it in a way, but then, you know, you'll go and you're competing against the guy from Gracie Baja or something like that, where you go, well, that's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. They don't really represent a specific style, right. you know, and I'm nowadays with gyms, you've got YouTube. It's not like you're getting a scroll with train style on it or whatever, you know, so it's, it's changed and you have to move on with that. But I think that it's good to retain some of the aspects of stuff. Otherwise what you wind up doing is, is having this weird, relationship with it where where it makes you overly confident you know the, the, this idea that if you ask anyone in the world you know do you think that you you're pretty scrap you know i'm pretty scrappy dude i'll get down you know i'll roll you know i'll get down and they think that they can fight and i, I just watched this little video some dude put out on this that was really funny he said uh if somebody asked you Hey man, can you solve this trigonometry problem for me real quick? You'd be like, fuck no, dude. Even if you had done that in school or something, you'd be like, dude, I haven't done that shit in forever. Yeah. There's no way. I'm not the guy. But if he goes, hey man, uh, you think you can fuck that dude up? You'd be like, I fuck you get I down. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the Wayne girl. Like, we took some major scores together. But the dudes will always say, yeah, I think I could win in a fight. And they have no reason to believe that. And, and then you get guys who train, say, jujitsu. And, you know, I remember our, uh, Ben, who, who I got my purple belt under, he said, if you put four purple belts together in a bar, they're going to fuck people up. But I don't necessarily always agree with that. They'll, they'll have some good game and good ground control, but I've watched dudes who are real good at jiu-jitsu get the shit beat out of them in a fight because they just weren't prepared for the well, speed. I think what it really comes down to is all of these things, um, you know, kind of like what you were talking about in your podcast is that we can discuss all of these things and you can be upset about some of these things and, uh, and, and criticize some of these things. But the greatest thing you can do, which is what we're doing is say, let's put devotion on the map. And I think some of the performances that we had this weekend, yeah. you know, we put everybody at finished in the top 20, uh, some of us in the top 10. You know, and that's in the world. And so you're like, if that doesn't put devotion on the map a little bit, yeah. well, I am, I'm 100% confident in the next couple of years, we will have a, a world sure. champion out of devotion. Yeah. And the, now we're here creating a culture and we've met many allies across the country that are, that are down with creating that same type of culture that we look to them for inspiration and they look to us for inspiration. And so at the end of the day, when you, when you say, okay, well, this is the culture that we're going to create yeah. and this is how we're going to do it. And, uh, and then you put it up the best way to do that. Like you said, is you go to world championships and you challenge every gym. Yeah. You know, and, you know, and, and, and I think that that's, that's the fact and, and sort of the sorry fact about some of this stuff is that it's not like shit's not hard and that you don't get that adrenaline and stuff in sport competition, but there's just very few outlets for anything else. You know, you can, you can train MMA and stuff and, and certainly that will make you a, a pretty capable fighter. There's no doubt. Um, but you know, 
I, again, I know guys who, who have trained MMA and who have even been in the cage and fought a few times. It's a much different situation, you know, being out there in, in something where it can go anywhere. And like what we just saw with, um, you know, yeah, Leandro, Leandro Lowe. Lowe, you know, you, you got good jujitsu and you mount a dude and you tell him, hey, are you done? And it wasn't like he couldn't have broke the dude's arm or his neck or whatever. And then gets up and the guy walks off four paces and shoots him in the face. And that, you know, gun culture has created a very, very, you know, uncertain sort of thing where all these kids these days are carrying guns. You get into a fight at school, you get shot. And, you know, the other thing, of course, is that, of your friends get shot. well, and the other thing, of course, is that, you know, kids can't go settle shit with fists anymore because right. they'll get counseling and they'll get a criminal charge levied right. against them. And, you know, we were talking about this earlier. You, you've got this message. The, the message that the system tries to feed kids from the very beginning starts so fucking young. I was in there at the, the Barnes and Noble kids section. And if you, if you want a trip, and you think that the world isn't this way, go into the kids section of the Barnes and Noble and look at all the books, especially in the like early concepts section, which tripped me out, you know, early concepts, the things that they need to learn. And the titles of these fucking books are a joke. There's a book in there called My Anti-Racist Baby. And I was like, how the fuck can a baby be anti and, and actually, I looked up some stuff. Scientifically, babies are actually super racist. Well, um, weird. And then, you know, you're like, uh, the, the, the best review I saw of that book, some guy goes, it didn't work. I read this book to my baby and he's still racist as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but like some of these things, you know, you realize that if you don't beat them to the start line on what narrative that you want your kid to grow up around, they're beating you to that fucking starting line because they know how to start conditioning kids from a very young age toward probably all the stuff that you hate and don't want them to be around. And then, you know, you wind up in this, in this fucked up situation because kids absorb information when they're that age. Yeah. And, it, and it's certainly, uh, the, and I think you said this, uh, this week too, is that their job, the teachers, the, the people who run the bookstores, sure. you know, any, any information line yeah. is their job is to brainwash your children, to make them not your children, to make them property of the United States. United States. That's right. Sure. And, they, and in order for them to do that, they have to make sure that they understand all these concepts and live by the same law that they want them mm -hmm. to, to, to abide by. And that, uh, you know, even from the basic idea of if a child at a very young age gets its toy stolen from him and he slaps the other kid, you have a child now who's, like you said, he's going to be in counseling, he might be get kicked out of school. He's going to be told that that was wrong mm -hmm. his whole life. Well, that's exactly what they want because they're going to be stealing from him sure. his whole life. They're going to be taking his money. For sure. They're going to be taking everything that he has. They're going to never allow him to own something. Yeah. And they don't want to get slapped for that. Yeah. And so as, as parents, you know, we all have a, a rough time as, as adults, whether you're around kids or you're a, you're a parent and you have, have, have children. You know of what environment you are going to raise your kid in, and what you're going to allow your kid to be around. You know, when I look, we we were uh, raised super strict, homeschooled kids, and my parents definitely tried to keep us from being around certain things like drugs, you know, alcohol, <laughs> and all this stuff. It didn't work, but uh, but they they said we do not want our kids uh, subjected to this, mm -hmm. and. In, and that we know that by letting them go to public school or letting them do these certain things, we will be subjecting them to this. Sit and you know what? I would, right, I would sit there and say, at this point, if it was freaking marijuana or pro-transgender uh, like, like uh, ideology brainwashing, I would light my kid a joint. <laughs> you and know what I'm those saying? are two pretty extreme choices. Well, I'm just saying that it's and everyone really knows big. marijuana is a right. gateway drug to transgender. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> but you know, it's just one of these things of, of how, if, if you're the type of person that doesn't want your children around drugs, yeah. and you're also the type of person that doesn't want your children around this modern, super lefty, progressive mm -hmm. ideology, then why are you paying to put them in this, oh, in yeah. this system I mean, it's crazy. and then still telling the, them? The, and, the, and the mental gymnastics that people right. will do to tell you like why they can't do it. Or, you know, when I, I made a post about it and all these guys were like, well, in my country, I'm like, well, fucking move, dude. You think right. you're the first person to ever move from your country to another country? Right. Uh, I am American. Right. The idea of America, I knew, but you know, it, it was funny. I was reading this, uh, I've been writing an article on 
sort of the, the zone, the gulag, and how it applies kind of to the way that people are trying to make the world now, and, and especially, you know, if you have any unpopular opinions and all this, and I've been reading Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago and all this, and there's this book called Psychopolitics, I think it's a KGB manual, and they talk about the way that you get a person to be completely devoted to the state is the first thing that you erode is his sense of self and his loyalty to himself because you go, well, no, 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 because you couldn't trust yourself in this situation. You were wrong here and you erode his trust in himself. Then you erode his trust in his family. Actually, your mom reported you, right. you know, and you erode this trust. And then the third one or fourth one or whatever is the state. And they said, you know, if we haven't won yet, if you're in a capitalist, then you, then you erode his faith in that. But if it's, if you have communism, you only reestablish faith in the state. Right. Right. And the crazy thing is in America now, that you imagine in the Soviet era, you go, yeah, that there was like fanatic communists back then, but that they had something, no matter how fucked up I think it is or how much I'm opposed to it, the communist state was a very real and concrete right. overarching idea and ideology. But in America, you, what's loyalty to the state look like? McDonald's? You right. know what I'm saying? McDonald's well, nationalism? They, yeah, they haven't figured that out yet. And that's well, and, they're, and the thing is, is they're anti-nationalist. Right. You know what I'm saying? So they don't even want you to be right. an American patriot or whatever the fuck, because that comes along with a lot of other baggage, which means well, you're, this is the you're getting arrested this is, on January 6th right. for wearing a Viking hat. Well, this, this is kind of the funny thing that I, re I remember seeing when I was uh, locked up as a kid, and I know I've spoken on this before, is that they were like, I was like, what are the rules here? And they're like, there are no rules. And I... I couldn't Sick. Right? <laughs> but no, they said there are only norms. Yeah. And norms are created by the social environment around you and created by your peers. Mm. And rules are things that maybe nobody likes but follows. Mm. But norms, social norms, are things that everyone must follow because everyone wants to be part of something. And the only right. thing that can happen if you don't want to follow those social norms is that you become an outcast. Right. And some people obviously are okay with that or can't help that. But a lot of cultures have done really well with that. Right. When you look at a, at a, at a, at a culture today, like an anti-national, anti-nationalist, anti-state state, they yeah. look at how they're controlling us. It's not through laws that they're making. No. It's through creating more and more social norms and yeah. these progressives that, that are saying, look, you can, yes, it's legal to to say that you don't like this idea. But if you but, say it, but if you say it, you no longer have sure. the, you no longer have all the activities. And because of privatized, privatized else. business and everything like right. that, you know, and, and the fact that it's corporate run and tech run, right. the, the things that they've sold everybody on is, you know, we're, we've been, we've discussed this many times, but seeing how much time people spend on Instagram or Facebook or TikTok or whatever it is these days that you take that away from somebody, man, and that's like taking a baby's pacifier oh, away from yeah. them, and they, they can freak the oh, fuck out. Yeah. And, you know, and you realize that even though it's stunting their growth physically, mentally, like all the rest of this kind of stuff, it's not good for you to be on that shit. But that the things that they've created, we were laughing because somebody was like, oh man, like, you know, the government's got the boot. The government doesn't even need to have the boot. Right. They don't need to make you use the cell phone. Right. You know, people want the cell phone. They want the... Well, yeah, I could have not put my data on there, but this way I can just face scan it and Amazon automatically sends me my groceries. Well, this is what Josh, it's convenience. Uh, when I was, we were talking with Josh and Seth this weekend when we were down in Vegas, uh, it was pretty nice, we had a pretty nice Airbnb, it was cool, you know, we yeah. spent most of our time sitting out there, uh, you know, just kind of uh, bullshitting and stuff. Dude, and in Vegas, yeah. you can go back to, like, because prostitution's legal there, so you don't have to do your own meal prep, or they'll right. do anything for $150, yeah. whatever, you get them to meal prep, uh, all that stuff. But so, and and one of the thing that, that Josh brought up was he was like, there's a lot of people we were talking about like the Andy Tate thing or something. And he said, the funny thing oh, is, is that people, people uh, who have businesses who are making money off of this stuff and who, who rely on, on social media to make their money are the ones who are actually pushing the edge of the envelope. And that if you put 10 people in a room that all believed what you believed, but you put them in, on the internet, they're gonna all say that, they're gonna make their post. You put them in a room and to where they're gonna say it, if they say it, they'll lose that, their social chips. Mm -hmm. And he was like, those seven people that all cuck out, 
They only have 10 followers on their thing. The only thing they have is it's all linked. So when they put a picture of their, yeah, their, yeah. Gra their grandkid up, it goes to the grandparents, it goes to all these people, and they don't have to worry about being like, oh, I forgot to send this to Mima or whatever. <laughs> and that's their own, but that convenience is enough for them to say, I can't lose yeah, this. Yeah, it's bro. not millions of dollars. I can't lose this. Yeah, yeah, they're not Andrew Tate being followers. like, listen, it's player versus player out there. Yeah. You know, this is a chess game. Uh, you know, and I, it is funny how much people will give up for how little they get back. Yeah. You know, and, and that nowadays the, the control structure is so crazy because it's so interconnected. And you and I were talking today about um, uh, Ray Dalio's book, Principles. And he's talking in principles about how this guy is so smart or, or crafty or clever yeah, or whatever. Was in the commodities market. In the commodities market, he said he, he was so tapped into this shit that he could see how much it would rain in Texas and tell you about how much things were gonna go up or down because how much it rained was about grain production. Grain production was how many beef cows went to the market, you know, how many steers there were. Yeah. Whether McDonald's stock was gonna go up because they had enough chicken nuggets or not. That yeah, sweet chicken, chicken nuggets, paste or whatever. Yeah, one of the big things you and uh, you know, you look at that kind of stuff and then you look at, uh, I, I made a post about um, uh, Raw Egg Nationalist book, the, the Eggs Benedict Option. And uh, a guy who I really like, uh, Vagard, uh, the yeah. jacked up chef, op werewolf dude from the old school, uh, he said something on there and I, I totally got what he said. He said, well, that's such a stupid fucking name. What the hell does food have to do with politics? And I thought it was a great question because I said the same thing. I was like, uh, but then you realize it has everything to do with politics because production control is the way that civilization began. And uh, check out his book. It's, it's really good. Antelope Hill publishes it. Um, those guys have like quite a few really good good books in their roster and uh the idea that you know agrarian society came about as a product of people saying look you can't control anyone you can't control a population of nomads of hunter gatherers you know you you just wind up with the young Naya like riding, riding through Europe and killing the everyone because they don't. You get them to put the seed in the ground. Well, I'm gonna stay here for <laughs> plus they, they you know the idea that uh if you've got milk and dairy and meat it's hard to just go okay well what's the one-to-one -one? but if you go oh it's grain you can literally walk into that field look at it and go this is how much you owe me right. this much percent of this and it's a really interesting book uh but the idea of where globally people are people people who are in positions of power uh and and who are controlling these policies where they want just what you eat. They want to control what goes into your body because of course they don't just want to control what you're eating. It's about vast amounts of resources and leverage and money and so on and so forth. And and culminating in shit like this stuff we're seeing with this fucking Amish guy. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm not you sure know, if you guys saw these, this, but they're uh, uh, obviously a well-to-do Amish farmer, which I was I was a say, lot of Amish people are very well. They're, they're making some money. They've done this, but he has a completely organic uh, farm. He's been doing it for 30 stuff. years. He's been doing it for 30 years. Probably making a pretty good bit of money. All of a sudden, sudden, and all of a sudden, federal government US marshals come in and raid him, charge him with $300,000 worth of fines, and then count his entire inventory so, he can't so they keep coming can't. back. So he and, and you know, even to, by his own admission, he's not been super cooperative. And you go, right. well, yeah, if people came onto your farm, where you said, first you of all, think creating well, and, food for the community would be as cooperative. Sure, as and, and, and first of all, you know, this is the most fucked up thing about the state. I don't care whether it's America or any other country. They don't provide people with the freedom to just go and fail on their own or do whatever they want to. If you're Amish and you say, look, we've been living the same way, pneumatic tools notwithstanding, right. the same way that we've been living since we came to this country, you know, when they were, you know, from Pennsylvania Dutch and all the rest of this kind of shit, we've been doing the same shit. You're fucking with us now. Just leave us alone to do our own shit. And they go, you know what? They would have, except you know how many dudes? That dude had 4,000 people a month on a subscription yeah. service. When you're making that kind of money, the government goes, yeah, we're gonna need a taste of that. Yeah. Or they decide, hey, look, we're in this whole thing where obviously they're trying to shift total control of meat production and all the rest, what you see down in Texas right now and all the rest of the shit that's going on. More and more and more, they're trying to shift production of things completely to, okay, let's have one company do all of this because it's easier, right. it's simpler. And, and more of us can profit easier, what, what they call in this eggs benedict option, uh, stakeholder capitalism, I think, where it's not just about the shareholders, it's about the stakeholders, who all benefits from this. Uh, but you know, it's, it's part and parcel with everything else that's going on in the world right now, which brings us to our end cap, which is the idea that 
all the stuff that we've ever talked about on here. Mostly we've talked about training, food, all the rest of this, and so on and so forth. And the, the idea that what you eat changes your brain, what you eat changes like your gut bacteria and all the rest, and literally changes the way that you think. And the way that you train changes the way that you think. You can go out there and look at all these studies on the idea that people who start to lift weights and who get strong and who eat like a cleaner diet with more meat and egg and stuff like this, higher cholesterol, higher testosterone, politically, it Weird. changes them. Weird. Yeah, and so the idea is, is if you don't want to be a pussy, don't eat like a pussy and don't train like a pussy and you probably and won't say what, you, are, you are what you eat, but not in this case. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Guys, look, we're going to try to do these more often. Uh, Matt's going to be working over here on this side of the country, hopefully a little bit more this year. And uh, so we're going to try to make this a regular deal again. So this is going up on the Barbarian Brothers YouTube. I'm sure it's Shadow Band yeah. uh, or whatever, but check it out. Share the video with your buddies and uh, we're going to be trying to do a lot more of these for you guys and maybe drop in some technique stuff and everything like that and tie it in with the devotion shit as well. And we've got some good street fight stories coming up as QR codes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. check out the next Street Fighter uh, devotion mag. And, uh, and also just thank you for all your support. I know on a couple of the different channels while we were out there uh, competing, you know, we were getting a lot of, a lot of support on those. For and sure. We definitely appreciate all that. And uh, hopefully next year we'll get to dangle some medals in your faces. And if you want to, if you want to hang out with me or Matt, um, hit us up on, on Telegram or whatever. Telegram is still the Wild West, about one of the only places that we're still allowed to be with any regularity. Hit us up if you want to come through on a drop-in. We're always down for respectful, cool people to come through and drop in and train with us. So hit us up. And it and looks come like train. I'll be uh, maybe back out in LA a little bit this uh, towards the end of this year. I'll be in uh, Salt Lake City uh, coming up. So yeah, hit so Matt up. If you're um, in the area, let us know. Yeah, we're on Telegram, or you can hit up my comments thread or whatever on my main channel, and I'll put you in touch with Matt if you're either in the Salt Lake area, LA, and if you're over on the East Coast of the country, we're not that far from you. It's a quick drive to come train with cool people and uh, you know have a coffee or a beer or something like that so we'll talk to you guys soon